Hi, Stacy. Hi, hi. <laughs> um, I'm a big pleasure to interview you. Maybe you can give a short, short, short introduction of yourself. Yeah. Uh, so my name is Cara Stacey. I'm a South African composer and musician. Uh, I'm also an academic. I do uh, research into different kinds of musics in Southern Africa. Um, I was born in Johannesburg in, in South Africa, but I, I spent most of my childhood in Eswatini, which is a little country ne between South Africa and Mozambique. Uh, it used to be called Swaziland. So I kind of grew up in there. I kind of consider myself, but, you know, coming from both of those countries um two very different countries obviously south africa with its very particular complicated past and then and swaziland or eswatini is a kingdom small kingdom uh having a lot of political problems at the moment but uh a very different environment small towns quite rural i grew up out in the countryside there um and then i studied in south i studied music in south africa and in the uk um, and yeah, I, 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 right now I'm a lecturer at a university in, in just outside of Johannesburg called Northwest University, and I work mostly in African music there. Uh, but my musical practice is, is between lots of different styles of music. And what is a good musical composition for you? This is a this is a hard question for me because I kind of because I work with indigenous music or traditional African music. Uh, I play some of those instruments. I studied them, and um, my research is mostly looking at rural people playing it. It's kind of like a folk music, indigenous music. Um, I guess for me, from that perspective, uh, I often enjoy music that that is kind of acknowledging in South Africa that that is. The, our environment, our sonic environment, uh, but people don't always make music you, citing those influences in a good way or in a very successful way. So, so I think I, I tend to lean towards music that has some kind of emotional or uh, cerebral hook that that I find interesting in some way. And if that relates to culture and politics, then that that grabs me as well. Um, but because I listen to music and I enjoy music from across like a whole lot of different styles, I think it's. I, it's more of an instinctive feeling of what I like rather than what I think is good. Some kind of complexity and craft in, in the music, I think, for me and, is important. And which was the last, uh, the last piece? Uh, which you uh, said, okay, I like it, right? It's instinctively. Um, of of anyone's, not my own. Of anyone's. Yes, of so anyone's. anyone's. Um, hmm, that's interesting. I think I've been listening to some music by a song, actually, like a songwriter called the magic lantern in the UK. He's a British songwriter, kind of more folk, folk style, but I really like his music. And that's something I listened to a piece of his recently. And I was like, this is a very successful composition. <laughs> I really like this. So yeah, it's, you know, that's how my, my listening is very broad. Uh, but also it has, especially his music has some kind of emotional content. So that's, that's important for me. Um, you mentioned about quoting is this, um uh sound environment and uh, did you quote in your music as well this indigenous uh, and music yeah um i often do mostly because it's it's what i'm i'm surrounded with in in terms of my research work all the time and now in southern africa we have we're having a whole lot of young people who are playing these instruments that 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 were you know associated with the rural areas and and people were kind of worried that these these very special instruments are kind of dying out um <clears throat> it was mostly elderly people playing them so now we have a really quite an interesting group of young people who are who are taking up these different instruments um so so there's actually it's not only me who's citing these things or you know there's there's really a, a very nice scene of of young people who who are either playing the instruments or playing some of the traditional repertoire but rearranging it in very interesting ways in new formats for me because i play some of the instruments um and obviously being a being a white south african in that space you know obviously this is not my original musical culture uh, even though I grew up with a lot of African, more like pop music, um, it's kind of I, I'm I'm doing it anyway because I'm taking those instruments and putting them in other contexts, like more scored contemporary music or um, 
more kind of electronic produced music or more experimental improvisatory music so so i may not i'm not citing it in the same way as in i'm not always bringing musical structures and then transposing them into other in, you know instrumental ensembles or something not always but uh because i'm often playing my own music i'm i'm usually taking those instruments and those sounds into these different spaces can you maybe uh, give us some examples and uh, from your works where yeah um so so my first album i was which is called things that grow which came out in 2015 um i was especially playing these two the two primary african instruments that i play umkhube which is like a mouth resonated bow um a musical bow and uh uadi which is like a looks like a hunt looked like berenbao like a big musical bow that has a, a calabash um i was very interested at that time i was i was trying to see how I could write for those instruments in a, in a different kind of context. It was mostly using jazz musicians based in the UK, um, but also trying to play with some of the structures so that the instruments that I play didn't form always like a textural drone at the back, but rather like play around with the different forces and structures so that the instruments were interacting in different kinds of ways, which is possible in studio because just because of the, some acoustic issues, the instruments are very quiet. Uh, but in a live context, it's much harder to do these these kinds of experiments. So, so it was kind of a unique opportunity to to play around with that. So, so the the end result is music that, uh, yeah, is is I guess cyclical in a lot of cases. Or um, I collaborated with my partner at the time, Shabaka Hutchings. So he wrote two or three pieces for that album, and and those are more kind of groove based pieces. Um, for me, it's a lot about textures and different roles and responsibilities on that album. But later on, um, 2018, I collaborated with uh, this Peruvian flute player, Camilo Angeles, and um, he that was completely improvised, completely improvised music. We had been playing a lot of more experimental stuff together. Um, and again, in that way, I guess it was more like using piano as well as all of these instruments that I play in the most free and open way possible and most responsive way with this flute player, incredible flute player. Um, so kind of trying to build up a palette of sounds for myself as a player um, that I could just draw on immediately and not seeing these things as distinct, like mm -hmm. the African instruments are here, piano mm -hmm. is here, composed music is here, improvised music is here, but kind of bringing everything together in, in the most free and natural way that I could um, so yeah, I guess those are the two, probably the, the, the most obvious examples of that. And um, one thing, right, uh, what you said is that, you know, you know, it's about merging this uh, uh, various um, uh, musical paradigms or, and, um, and various instruments, but um, what could be like other things, how you would describe uh, your music? Mm. Um, I think... <laughs> A bit schizophrenic probably is the best way <laughs> to describe it, uh, just because each project is 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 so different. <clears throat> I think, I think I'm, yeah. So it's a little bit hard to draw like a a line through all of them, uh, or it, maybe a line through my practice. Right now, I've been like in the past two or so years, I've been working with a trio, a jazz guitarist and a and a visual artist, and myself, and we've been. The, between the three of us, we've been composing uh, together and apart for each other. Um, <clears throat> and I guess that that for me, that's a little bit where I'm at right now, is just exploring how you can create concepts and fixed ideas across different uh, disciplines, artistic disciplines, together, and also bring together musical structures in, 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 in unexpected ways, in this kind of fusion way without all the baggage of how it's been done before um so so in that case i'm also writing piano i'm writing for all instruments and the jazz guitarist also wrote on my instruments for me and the visual artist we use graphic scores but then he also has musical ideas that he gives us and we develop together so so kind of breaking down composition down to something a little bit more collaborative but then also just going step by step through different ways. How much is fixed? How much is improvisatory? How do we how do we navigate those things? I guess process. I think I'm interested in process. If I draw a line through everything, yes. yes. And what and, and what triggered uh, collaboration? 
S sorry? Um, what triggered you start these oh. cooperation uh, practices, right? What um, well, in, in this particular case of the, this ensemble, the texture of silence is the trio. Um, it was because we had all kind of, the three of us had been talking about working together, each of us in pairs for a while, and then it was COVID lockdown. <laughs> so, so working with a trio, a small trio, when we were able to meet up, um, was, was quite easy. So that, that was possible. I think in the case of the other collaborations, um, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to be resourceful a lot of the time. Who's around me? Who am I connecting with musically? Uh, who, who, who's, who's around that, that we kind of connect in terms of musical ideas or other ideas? And how can we, how can we do something creative, like making stuff all the time rather than not <laughs> making stuff, which I think in terms of my, my, my classical training, there was an emphasis on or at least it, it it wasn't the most constructive, creative environment to learn. So so as soon as I kind of managed to be free of that, I was I was looking around for opportunities. Like oh, this the the flute player I met on a residency in America, and I was like, we really play well together. We we really we have a lot of connections. We're also both coming from the southern hemisphere, kind of complicated countries, similar politics. Um, and and we're, we're making music really well together, and so then that collaboration is born. And so it's it's trying to be resourceful and 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 learning while I'm doing things and making music, rather than sitting and waiting twenty years until I've done the best thing that I've ever yes. that I'm ever gonna do. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, I just uh, somehow mm, interrupted when you said the, uh, the word process, right? That you are interested more in the process. Into protest. Into no protest, but protest. Oh, protest. protest. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly, exactly. Can you um, just, uh, explain that a bit? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I mean, I studied composition uh, actually in high school and then at, at university as well. But I've really, f I don't know. I, th I guess having emerged from my undergrad studies and and then after that, I was doing kind of musicological research. I wasn't really thinking too much about composition. I was doing a lot of composing and playing. But in terms of academic studies, it was more about research into music away from that. Um, and so I've kind of always felt that I, I didn't have adequate training, or, or I felt like this was something that I don't fully understand. Or when I when I build up that practice myself, I'm doing it in a little bit of an erratic way, like now I'm interested in this, I'm doing that, now I'm changing, now I'm doing that. So, so this idea of process has kind of fascinated me because I feel like I didn't come from one school of like, this is how you compose. Um, and so that, yeah, it's, it's, it's an interest for me. Uh, and because of working in lots of different spaces, like even amongst indigenous African music, like people are composing in lots of different innovative ways. So, so being inspired by that and thinking like, how, how, how are they doing that? What if I, if I'm inspired by that way of working and I translate that into a kind of mixed chamber ensemble, what does that sound like? Or if I am now trying to do electronic stuff, how does that, how does that relate to all of these different ways of making music that are all composing? Um, and I, and I think that it, it's it's not uncommon in South Africa to feel that way because, you know, a kind of high art classical composition was held up uh, as like the most important, only real way of making serious music. So mm -hmm. so in deconstructing that and as as time goes on now especially now with this move a new move towards decolonization it's kind of it's important to take a step back and say well is that the only way why am i being judged in that way when actually there are all of these centuries old traditions of making music right over here and and they are doing things also in complicated ways complex high art ways or sometimes in simple beautiful ways and 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 all of these different processes in terms of actually creating music are, are just interesting to me. And what is uh, your way? How you usually compose music, how you start and what kind of process you use? Yeah, I, I think it depends on the, the project because it's, it's, I'm doing a lot of different things. Um, so, so if it's something electronic, I usually have a kind of nervous breakdown for about two weeks and then I finally start. 
<laughs> and start building things. I often use with use like found sound stuff or I have like a bank of really nice recordings, field recordings and other things that I've collected over the years. Sometimes if I'm struggling to start the process, I kind of go back, do lots of listening and think about sound in a, maybe a little bit more of an abstract way. Um, in terms of scored stuff, I find, especially recently, I'm, I'm, I am drawing a lot of these more interlocking structures from some of the musics and the instruments that I play. So often that will be the starting point. Uh, there's a little Indira, like a little Kalimba that I play from Mozambique. And that even just coming up with simple melodies that you can then expand uh, upon if, you, if you're using other instrumental forces. That's often a nice way to start the process and then and then it can change and build into something big. Um, and so I often have have characteristics that come from experimenting on the on the actual instruments that I play um, as well. Um, yeah, so so often just little sketches, trying to build it up in a systematic way, trying to make use of um, I take influence from Kevin Volans, the big uh, South African composer based in Europe. Uh, and Claire Loveday, who's a fantastic composer based in Johannesburg, who I was also having lessons with uh, for a while. I should actually probably go back to her. Um, but but this idea from both of them that, you know, you don't leave any resources like untapped. You know, you sit and you accumulate, you think through everything that you have at your disposal, all your tools, uh, all the possible sounds that you could get out of different instruments and then and then start when you have a full palette. That's that's an ex a kind of useful idea for me when I'm starting a piece is just even just systematically going like, okay, all different extended techniques or all different possibilities of sound and then and then start with something small and build build from there. Uh, but this what you are saying now, uh, you do it like uh, like by trying out like or you just uh, or it's more like mind exercise. Um, trying out, I think you know also just being a playing musician i kind of need to hear things uh it's kind of hard for me to write if i'm not hearing exactly what it is that i want otherwise i find i i i feel very ambiguous it could be one way or the other i don't i don't have a feeling about it so it's nice to it's nice to be able to try everything out and and have a sense okay then i can have particular ideas or preferences about things good good and um, how, um, and what is the, your experience and how you compose music in these collaborations, right? Because um, one thing, of course, if you do it's in electronic, right? When it's you, you, you are on. But even in, if uh, if you write for ensembles, there are already right some, some collaboration involved, right? Mm. Yeah. I, I again, it just depends on the project. Yeah, a lot of the a lot of the recorded stuff uh, that I have out on albums is has been more kind of collaborative in most cases. Uh, the Texture of Silence album, which is that trio that with that visual artist, that that was built up of uh, composing apart and composing together, quite singular and collaborative together. But but the other recorded projects were quite um, collaborative with those particular individuals. But it, it depends, you know, I've also been asked to do other uh, production work or kind of uh, reinterpreting of things electronically or creating um, uh, sound pieces and then that you know that can be quite singular um, I think there have been there have been a few things that's often quite related to research work because because in South Africa now there's a real push towards doing more kind of arts-based research or having creative outputs in the kind of university system which is a, is a whole other complicated story about how they assess that and and all of that but but um but that often has meant that that i've been able to do quite interesting projects like um i did a, a postdoctoral fellowship where i was looking at a uh the a, a kind of perpetual flute machine like instrument that was designed in the 1200s by by a man called al uh, al jazari and um so I had to kind of make, make a prototype of that instrument. It was part of this kind of early Indian Ocean network of research, musical research called Recentering Afro-Asia. Um, and then I built a sound piece out of the sounds that came out of this prototype that I made. Um, which so, the, so in that case, 
the, the basis of, of the musical ideas and the, and the prototype building was quite solitary. And then the actual making of the music was, was not really collaborative in any way. Um, so, so it just depends on the kind of project. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, uh, what are the most important technological artifacts, uh, what you use the most? It could be software or hardware. Mm. Um, well, I use, I use Logic a lot for most of the, the, the electronic stuff. Um, I mean, I, I, I right, right now I'm, I'm writing more scored music for a kind of chamber fusion chamber ensemble for next year. We have a big national arts festival. So I'm have some gigs then. Uh, so then it's obviously I'm using Sibelius. I'm, I'm, I'm mostly thinking through those ideas in a more conventional scored way. Um, but yeah, in terms of technology, also just my in, my actual instruments, <laughs> very important. When I play when I play live, I'm trying to use effects, so I use a couple of guitar pedals as well through with those instruments, um, just because I like the sound and I kind of I guess that's part of my distinctive sound as a performer now. Um, so there's some hardware and software that is part of my everyday uh, musical life. Um, nothing too exciting. I keep telling myself I'm going to learn uh, Max MSP or something like that, but I so far have not had the time <laughs> to do stuff like that. Um, so, so yeah. But I mean, yeah, I'd be lost without listening capability and my DAWs and the hardware that I travel with. Even now in Sweden, I have all of these things with me. And uh, <clears throat> are you creating uh, multimedia pieces as well, where when you use uh, the vi uh, videos or pictures or, or dance? Yeah. So. Um, so in terms of dance, I have just been part of a program in South Africa. Uh, there's a really, really amazing art center called the Center for the Less Good Idea uh, based in Johannesburg. And I was just now, before I came to Sweden, um, I was a part of a, you kind of, it's kind of like a little residency uh, period throughout the year. You meet up and you have workshops and you develop works with, uh, it was mostly dancers and, and theater makers. Um, so that was, uh, we just I, I created a work for that, uh, for dancers and a visual artist and, and for musicians. And so we performed that a couple of weeks ago. Um, but especially during COVID, obviously we started doing a lot of stuff uh, online and that meant a lot of video work. Um, I wouldn't say I'm the best at it, but it was really, I found that a really nice way of working as well, especially once, you know, having come from this more traditional training of like, you wouldn't even necessarily be making electronic music, you would be writing for actual human ensembles. And that's the way that you compose. There's no other way to, you know, the next step past that for me as a working musician was was not involving those ensembles or involving different types of ensembles and then doing more production and and electronic composing and then the the next step for me in the past few years away from that was also being able to do that myself and then also create my own visual accompaniment to that or, or integrate a video uh, with the, my musical ideas so so I've done a little bit of that, and it was mostly because of COVID, actually, that it kind of forced me to to do that. There were opportunities to create online works. Um, and so myself and, and quite a few other South African composers started doing that. And what you have learned, right? What is different between composing sound only or, let's say, multisensorial piece? Are there differences mm. or...? I, I think there must be um, from a few filmmaking friends of mine. There definitely are. There's a. I think there's a level of complexity that I think if you're just a musician or composer and you're just trying these things for the first time, that you're maybe not always nailing some some of those aspects to do with like visual literacy and 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 cadences and and dynamics in in visual work. Um, but I really like because I anyway feel like doing things in a DIY way a bit low tech is, is kind of suits me well, because you can play around like a child, you can be more creative, because you're not worrying about it being very serious or being the best or whatever. Um, that I think, so, so so the video work, it's been interesting to just kind of feel my way into it and think, okay, that is working, or this is what I'm trying to say. Most of the time, I have to admit, it's very reliant on the sound. So 
it's a it's a different aspect especially when you're evoking something an idea or a feeling or or or, or um so so it it was especially at first quite frustrating because i would feel like this is not looking the way i want it this is not what i want but i also don't have this i don't at that point didn't know how to make it what i wanted so now i have some kind of basic skills i think it's getting a bit better but it's it's a, it's a really nice thing to learn um how to bring these things together in a successful way and um how your music changed in the last 10 years Mm, a lot. Wow. Um, yeah, I think, you know, I think the last 10 years for me have been a move away from, from <clears throat> like separating everything in my life, like research, ethnomusicological work like this, playing work like this, composing work. I don't know, I, I definitely feel even just in the past two, three years, things have kind of started coming together in a really integrated way. Uh, like these things are all speaking to each other and I don't have to worry about it's not like I'm spreading myself so thinly that these are actually coming together especially creatively like I, I have a lot of resources I have a lot of ideas that come from all of these other things that I have to do all the time for my actual job my lecturing job um, so so I think yeah I think it's been the last 10 years have been a process of kind of finding more freedom uh, and, and working out what a composer looks like from my perspective, uh, which is very, very different to what I would have imagined 10 years ago. Good, good. And um, would, <clears throat> would your music would be different, right, if you would uh, live in Berlin? If I lived in Berlin? Yes, for example. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's a very good question. Um, yes, I think so. Just because 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 of being in Johannesburg, I'm I'm kind of close to Swaziland. I'm close to a lot of the musicians that are playing these indigenous instruments that I'm yes, interested in. Yes. So so for me, it's just a three hour drive, and then I'm in the countryside where I'm working with musicians I've been working with for for 10, 15 years now. So so if I ever need to kind of remind myself about what I really value in music, I can just quickly go and do that, and come back. I I would like to think I would find a, some kind of equivalent in Berlin of, of checking into to people who are making music in interesting, innovative ways, but they're not doing it for any of contemporary reasons like Instagram likes or, or to get grants or to get into degree programs or anything. Actually, they're just committed to music in like the purest way possible throughout their whole lives for themselves, for other people, for the joy of actually just working with musical building blocks. Um, I like to think wherever I am, I would be able to find people who are doing that. I hope, I hope so. Cause they are, I mean, people are doing this all around the world. Um, I think we can get quite into our own heads about how we compose, uh, or worrying about composition in different ways. But uh, yeah, as long as I have access to someone who could remind me of that, I think I would be and, fine. And what was your first encounter with, those, uh, with this culture? So I was, I mean, I guess a listening encounter when I was young, I had actually in when I was in nursery school, I had like a tape of these instruments. Uh, so I kind of knew the sounds already, but uh, I grew up, my parents, my family were listening to a lot of African music, uh, but more commercial music, like pop music. So so it wasn't really, that was more an interest. But uh, when I went to university, I was studying classical piano composition. Um, and I had, a, there was, there's a lecturer at that university, University of Cape Town, Dizu Plaikis is his name, uh, extremely fantastic musician, but also very important in terms of kind of uplifting a lot of these instruments and the musical traditions and contexts that they come from. So <clears throat> he's a lecturer there, he's still, he's there now, associate professor. Uh, and you can study instruments with him. So, so I kind of, I think in my second or third year, I thought, okay, I'm really interested in this. I think classical piano is, I was not, I don't know, I was feeling some discomfort about that. Um, and I started having lessons with him. Once I'd already had been having lessons with him for a couple of years, I, I kind of was thinking back to the fact that I grew up in the small country, Swaziland, Eswatini, where, um, there had to be those same instruments. I kind of knew they were on stamps. <clears throat> you could see the you could see the images around, 
but I never actually heard anyone, even just in the rural areas where I lived, you, I didn't hear anyone playing those instruments. Lots of singing, but but not a lot of traditional instruments. So um, it was only after my undergrad that I I went back and I was I, I met a couple of people who were also interested in local mu music making there. And then one man in particular, Vusi Sbanze, who's like been a, a lifelong friend since then, uh, he said, oh, no, he because he comes from another village. He was like, oh, actually, I know quite a few people who play instruments like this. So he took me the first time to go and introduce me to a very important uh, player of, of the one big musical bow. Um, but also uh, he used to make instruments as well. This man, Mkulu Bemani Magagula, he's passed away now. Uh, so that was the first time that was 2011. 2010 or 2011, I can't remember. It was a long time ago. Um, and that was the first time I met him. And then he ended up during my PhD, that man ended up being my teacher throughout my PhD. Um, so that was the first time. And then after that, yeah, it's just been, you know, it's been an ongoing, thanks to my PhD work and funding for my PhD, I've, I've been able to just go and spend time. My family were living there for about 20 years. They've now moved back to South Africa. So now I just go as, as often as I can. I go to Swaziland to go and meet with the musicians. And we, we myself and Vusi, we, we started like an ensemble for many of the musicians so that they can earn some money as well. Uh, so, yeah, it's a kind of long, long relationships now. Got it. Got it. Got it. Yeah. And um... Your curiosity, right? Uh, your cur uh, cur um, how it, your curiosity, right? Yeah, yeah. How how it's important looking back, right, for your uh, own musical career as composer. How important the quality it was. I think really important, um, because, I mean, I think I think that thing of being between genres has, firstly, just on a kind of practical level, it's really helped my career. So, so now, you know, I mean, there, there's some funding that I've been able to get. There's, there's, um, you know, for different projects because they're a bit unusual because they're crossing over some boundaries. They're kind of a little bit more unusual. I've been really lucky to get money to, to carry on making music. Uh, sometimes in, you know, in South Africa, there is not a lot of money for the arts. So, so often we're relying on European, like Swiss funding to, to help facilitate a lot of these artistic projects unless they are very very commercial and then people make a lot of money but but when it's slightly less commercial music it's it's really hard to survive so so i think in that way it's been so helpful i mean on a, on a practical level it's been helpful also because my curiosity led me to carry on my studies and so i'm a good writer i can i can apply for funding i can do big applications you know i'm, I'm i can articulate my ideas i've got a lot of practice doing that from academia which has been helpful but I think also, and, and you interviewed Matthijs van Dijk, so you'll know, I think he's another curious composer. And I think, you know, it's not an easy environment to survive in if you want to make, if you want to basically be able to feed yourself and pay rent. <laughs> to be a composer in South Africa is extremely, extremely difficult. So you have to be curious because you have to find alternative ways of making your music happen. Um, whether it's starting a concert series, a friend of mine, uh, the two of us, Nicola Dutoy, we started a, a concert series together, mostly because we were struggling, venues were not creating a platform for more interesting music. So it was like, you have to be a bit curious, a bit entrepreneurial, you have to be able to apply for money, because you're probably not going to earn enough money off anything you do. And I, I think this is an issue for a lot of new music people around the world is that we're very, you know, we rely on funding a lot. But I think that in South Africa, in particular, it's it's difficult, because there's just so little money for these things. It's kind of like a sink or swim situation. So, so anyway, most of the composers I know have are usually aligned to an academic institution, or are relying on these European funding grants, uh, or, or teaching a lot. Um, so so being curious is, is really important in terms of making your music sound like something new and interesting and something a bit different, but then also in terms of being able to understand, not only make your own music and, and have it played, but also, okay, how do we record it? Is there a way that we can tap into this kind of audience or how can we get it performed in different kinds of contexts? Or, you know, you have to approach this from lots of different angles because it's, 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 it's not like Europe, unfortunately, it's, it's pretty different. 
and uh, um, would your risk would be different if you would uh, be male or, mm, or, or would your career would be different right if you would be male then? very good question i think i am the one of the very rare cases where being a woman in this kind of music has actually helped because and then not in a good way because basically i've often found myself in projects where i'm the only woman so it's like for whatever reason i like to think it's because of my, what i'm bringing musically but but i think often it's because uh there are just not enough women around to insert into these different kinds of projects like fusion jazz touring project or electronic music um you know in that case is even even fewer women involved in southern africa uh, in that kind of music so so often i've i've actually i think i've benefited a little bit from being sometimes the only woman in the space by getting opportunities that maybe if i was a male i wouldn't be getting if you know what i mean yes but so, why it's, why it's, so it's some kind of funding stuff right so it's yeah so project requires uh, gender balance or no, I don't think not stipulated. I mean, it's not usually stipulated like that uh, in Southern Africa, but it, but just that the optics of yet another all male ensemble or all male project are just too much. Uh, so so it's made me uncomfortable sometimes because then I look around and I'm like, okay, well I am I am the only woman here, and why? Because they because I myself know many women doing interesting things. Um, but but for me, yeah, there, there, there are two things that are always working in my career, which is the fact that I'm a woman and that also that I'm white, but I work in African music. It, these are things that are really complicated that I have to keep thinking about all the time as I go into different projects and, and, and thinking about the sensitivities around these things. Got it, got it. Um, <clears throat> what is your, uh, your uh, composer fear? Why, what do you fear? the most as composed? Hmm. Um, I think a lack of ideas scares me. I've had a few experiences or just one or two where, where I had a residency, very nice, like paid experience to go and write music. And for whatever reason, I just kind of struggled uh, to, to come up with anything or I felt a little bit depressed and I kind of couldn't, I wasn't composing easily. That is quite a scary experience for me. Um, and it's happened often when I have a lot of money to do something, <laughs> which is a bit of a, a wasted opportunity. Um, it, but sometimes I think I've learned at this point that if that happens, you know, I spend a lot of time doing a lot of free improvisation. So, yeah. so then improvisation can really help kick me out of something like that. So I think by this point, I have some tools to deal with a situation like that. But that, that thing of maybe for whatever personal or work related reasons, you kind of are struggling to compose something and it's not just a couple of days of not being able to come but actually extended time like weeks and weeks that scares me that scares me a lot <laughs> and why do you still compose why do i still compose um i'm not actually sure it feels good to do it <laughs> it's fun it's interesting uh it's really challenging i think especially if things are not flowing very easily. I think it requires diligence and, and a kind of, um, uh, yeah, some kind of discipline, some self-discipline to do it. But I think it's, it's, a really, it's a really interesting way of bringing together what you know and solving some kind of problem or some kind of task, you know, a, you know applying what you know. And, and I think especially when you are, like me, interested in all these different kinds of musics, it's a really interesting task to try to bring together the structures in, in, in interesting ways, in a way that works for you. Um, it's not always easily something you can quickly resolve, but, and, and, and I think a lot of really interesting questions come up when you are trying to practically make music in that way. Uh, some, of the, some of these are like ethical questions that I think academics spend a lot of time talking about, but actually when you sit down and compose or, or you've created a piece and you're sitting with different kinds of musicians trying to make the piece happen, immediately issues come up, like how's that going to work or, or different aesthetics or aesthetic systems are kind of hitting each other. You know, immediately so much of the stuff that people spend a lot of time theorizing over is immediately obvious when you are creating new music in that way. 
which I think is very interesting. Um, and it's kind of like instantaneous feedback on a lot of these quite important issues about culture. So, so I guess that's why I kind of, I wish I, because of my academic job, I, I don't get to compose as much as I would like. Um, but I think that means that when I do have a chance to sit down and actually write like that, I really value it now. It's, it's much more prized for me. Mm -hmm. Good. And um, now I will have uh, some questions, uh, not maybe you as a composer, but you as a composer and observer, right? More about, we will talk more about uh, uh, new music scene or contemporary art music scene mm -hmm. or contemporary classical music scene in South Africa. How it changed uh, during this century? Mm. I think it's changed a lot. Um, I'm, I'm sure Mateus would have covered some of this in his interview, but um, the, you know, it was, it was in the kind of very stereotypical way. It was dominated by old white men, um, and you know that makes no sense in the context of contemporary South Africa. Even though, I mean, I studied with some of those old white men and some of them were really, really brilliant, made beautiful music, like really, really lovely. Um, I, I think some of those individuals, because, it, 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 because it's not common and there's not a lot of money for it. So it was just a couple of composers, prominent composers, usually at academic institutions. I think there wasn't always this really constructive, open environment for people to come study composition and create their own works and, and develop some kind of artistic voice. I think that's changed, or that is starting to change. Um, I, I think I'm seeing, and, and, and this is not only from within universities, but also outside of universities, a few more people, a few more people interested in, in composing in that way, but at the same time doing, working as, as mixing engineers, or at the same time as teaching, at the same time as, so there's a kind of realness a, de a, a real time deconstruction of this kind of very old European idea that you have some kind of patron and you can just produce work throughout your life, which is how a lot of these older composers were operating, uh, having academic jobs, <clears throat> full time academic jobs. Um, whereas now it seems like it's there's an opening things seem to be a little bit more um, uh, realistic and a little bit more down to earth and a little bit more like uh, you know, the real market forces of trying to get your music out there in a, in a space where not a lot of people are interested in it, or not a lot of people are interested in music in that way. Actually, music is functioning in a very, very different way uh, in society. It's like the challenge of that, I think people are more in touch with and they're being more creative around those challenges because they don't necessarily have these full time jobs or to kind of protect them or and also that they're just more people out there trying to say I have a voice and this is what I'm this is what I want to say artistically um, I wish there was a bit more support for these musicians and composers because you know we have a very thriving like contemporary art scene in South Africa extremely like extremely good really nice museums and galleries and and actually a lot of money going into visual arts contemporary like very cutting edge vi vi visual art so I kind of wish that there was enough support in that way for composers who are essentially doing similar similar work but unfortunately there isn't so hopefully that is something that will still change uh, as people realize oh wow this is really you know this person is doing something really interesting and has something to say in this language um but yeah so so I think in that way it's been it's quite an quite a fast change from from this old very unrealistic dated model of like a composer in the ivory tower doing you know working in a particular way and nothing else is good enough and you know not that i mean my lecturers in composition were fantastic people and very lovely and inspiring so but but i know that this is something that people especially of the older generation complained of it was a lot of closed doors and you know feeling like okay because south africa in that way if you're only looking to europe then South Africa is the periphery. So it's like nothing anyone does in South Africa is gonna be good enough, um, which is a very, very different way of looking at South Africa as a home for really interesting artistic work that we don't actually have to reference anything else. We're actually all here. We have a very particular, very difficult history, but that has meant like really interesting artists have emerged from that. And, and even if you take out the political history of the last hundred years, like and hundreds and hundreds of years, 
you know, we have, we're a place in which people from all over the, around the world have kind of come to this place. There's like a cosmopolitanism that, that is very intense in South Africa. So, so I think there's, I think there's just, there's that shift from like being a kind of composer in the model of a European composer, not even a contemporary European composer, one from like hundreds of years ago, but, but actually moving away from that to something that is more everyday, you know, composers as facilitators of other people's listening and work and, and learning composers as people who are have a day job but then compose at night uh, you know a little bit more everyday kind of approach and also just obviously from a race perspective like a lot more black voices coming up in composition uh which which already disrupt that kind of quasi european model um so that's very exciting i think and how musically it changed um, I think because you now have lots of different kinds of voices, not only, not only do you have different music, the music sounds different, people are citing different things, they're taking influence from different things, uh, but also you have different formats, like some really interesting work is happening in like electronic music, for instance, so, or people, you know, crossing genres, crossing different formats and ways of working, um, and so to keep that that the term new music as like open as possible like it's it's a much musically it sounds very very different to what was again like quite a standard thing where you wrote operas uh symphonies big orchestral works uh chamber music and some solo works and and a lot of that stuff historically was very very pretty it was very beautiful music and and in some cases extremely difficult to play complex music but but it wasn't in the case of some composers, it wasn't even keeping up with 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 what was happening in contemporary music in Europe. Anyway, it was anyway very dated. So, so so I think it's it's it sounds very very different now. And I think and I think more people are open to the possibility of new music and serious composition, including indigenous instruments, including some pop aesthetics, uh, including electronic music, including more avant-garde musics that weren't really, you know, considered, they were seen as so like um, liminal, they were not integrated into new ways of thinking about sound. I think this, this has changed. It probably still needs to change some more, but, but this seems to be one of the biggest changes since my, my undergraduate studies until now, yeah. Yes, and uh, um, in, in our conversation, uh, you mentioned once, uh... And there was protest or is a protest of decolonization, right? Of, yeah. of the music field. Can you just uh, yeah. elaborate on so, how so, it happened? Yeah. What initiated, right? Yeah, yeah. So so I mean this is there's a lot of conversation about what that term even means and, and what that looks like. So I can just say from my perspective, just just being kind of with a few looking at a few different musical scenes and and also being a part of universities through my my research work uh, because universities were a big part of this recent wave of decolonization in south africa having said that you know decades ago during a part the apartheid regime many people have been working on decolonization for a long time we have many important texts and thinkers and writers about these things so so i think what needed to happen in south africa is that after 1994 when Nelson Mandela and the ANC came into power and it was a, the new democracy, the, the real democracy, because the one before was not so democratic. Um, <clears throat> it was a big political change and it was a time of like a lot of positivity. But at the same time, the, the effect of apartheid was that was such a massive division, not only in terms of race, and cl but class. So like inequality, even now in South Africa, is a very, very unequal place in terms of money. You know, a huge amount of the population, most of the population is living in circumstances that I, I can't even describe to you. They're so bad. Um, and then there's a tiny, tiny little elite on top of that who are doing OK by, by European standards, kind of middle class people. Um, and then even smaller on top of that is people doing very, very well, very wealthy, benefiting from all of this. So the, the, the levels of inequality are very high. So I think. <clears throat> At some point, I guess it was around the 2010s, you know, once a, a period of time had passed, and I think many Black South Africans were thinking that their lives would have been better. And 
and nothing really changed. If anything, economically, things kind of got worse. Um, or definitely by now, people would say that things have gotten have gotten worse. I think the younger generation came up and were just like, nope, <laughs> this is ridiculous. We are done with this. And many big institutions, you know, universities are anyway slow to change. <clears throat> but, uh, you, you know, we're still teaching in these really archaic ways um, and very hierarchical and hegemonic and a lot of European material being taught, which in an African context, we, you know, we were, South Africa had already had hundreds of years of that. So it was like, it's not relevant for anyone. And if anything, it's kind of causing a lot of problems, cultural problems and, and, you know, working in, from my, my research perspective, like there are a whole lot of really old, important African musical traditions that are getting neglected because people are trying to study organ repertoire from like the 1700s. Many, many people like the. It's not just like a couple of people are interested in that. Everyone, it's like a strong preference for European music, which is just leaving lots of other things uh, in a damaged situation. So that that's just the musical perspective. But in terms of universities, uh, university students, people were feeling like they can't even afford to be at university, uh, and a lot of these structures need to change. So, so it started with university students at. Um, UCT, but it spread to, so in Cape Town, University of Cape Town, but it spread to many other universities across Southern Africa, most of them actually. Um, and the students were just completely fed up. And I think it was a very, it was a very challenging moment for many people, but it was also a really empowering, it kind of a reminder that actually we do need to go back and revise things and change things. Uh, we can't have a situation where students are trying to be at university and are starving. This is just not a situation that can carry on. And it was as serious as that. So, so anyway, it was now it's, it's, it's complicated because now everybody who wants to get funding or wants to, to appear contemporary and up to date is trying to talk about decolonization, but this is a very complicated thing. Um, and sometimes I, I'm, I see when I'm like working on conferences and I'm reviewing abstracts, pe everyone is talking about decolonization, but not many of the people are actually doing decolonization. So immediately it's, it's, it's become very kind of contentious. But I think it's just an inspiring moment where students were kind of just saying that we can't live with this inequality uh, because wealthy white people in South Africa, but also wealthy white people in the world have taken a lot of what would have built up our country. And there is racism in, in many of these older European structures that has to be kind of taken apart so that everybody gets a fair chance so that we don't sit in a situation where we have a whole panel of examiners for a PhD and they're all white and they're mostly men. When the PhD is about something completely different to do with I don't know, African languages or, you know, that we, we actually have to have some changes in these institutions. And, and that goes for business as well, like the private sector as well, but, but it was mostly the state institutions that came under fire. So, so yeah, it's, it's a long, long story. Um, and I think it was a moment for people to vent. And it was a very important moment for everybody else to say, okay, wait, the young people are telling us something that's very important. And we have to remind, we have to go back. And this is something, it's not something that you just do the work and then it's over. This is actually a long process. Uh, and, and because of apartheid, apartheid was a very ingenious system in that the legacy of it, I don't know when we will be rid of the, the damage that that system did because it's, it's very long lasting. So, so even now in my life, now I'm teaching at a university which is outside of a, of a big city. It's in a small town and I drive through all these mining areas, like lots of mines, uh, as I go to that town to teach. And it's a very, <laughs> this is quite a depressing viewpoint of the country where I think if you're in the cities, you can think like, okay, this is very, you know, nice galleries and restaurants and, you know, it's quite nice. It's, it's obviously there are a lot of poor people, but life in the big South African cities is like, I don't know, like London or, you know, but as soon as you're outside and you see how people are really, most South Africans are living, it's very disturbing. Uh, so I think, yeah, it's just, it's, it's the, the idea that, the, that many things have to change, that we can't take focus away from examining these privileges that have been there that are from another time and from another place that have to be broken down and rethought 
Um, so, so I think a lot of good work has come from it, but it's not something that you don't just flip a switch and it happens. This is something that just has to keep, we have to yeah. just keep talking yeah. about it and keep examining it and keep seeing it in ourselves and our own work. I think yes. that's really important. Yes. Yeah. And uh, is it somehow change uh, musical language as well? Are there more integrated with uh, local instruments or local music or local musics or, or? Yeah, I think, I mean, in South Africa, it's weird because in, in, in classical composition, people were already citing from about the 80s, people were citing a lot of indigenous instruments, especially white composers were doing that anyway. So we kind of have quite a long history of people doing that. Some people did it better than others. Uh, some people did it in kind of a clumsy way and others did it in a really beautiful, authentic kind of way. But but all of those works, obviously, from the perspective of now, seem a bit kind of a little bit dated or in some cases kind of controversial. How if you didn't know much about a culture and then you just kind of took it in a musical idea and then you just put it in your piece and you didn't really bother to research or speak to any of the musicians who did that kind of music. You know what I mean? It can get kind of complicated quite quickly. But I would say now there are in some ways meaningful projects where people are encouraged to engage with these, these ideas. It's not only musical ideas, but also kind of cultural things or philosophical ideas to do with different African cultures. But, but then in some superficial ways, you can have calls for works where we'll say, must exam must uh, demonstrate African influence. But but in my experience and knowing some of the people who do those calls, they don't even know what that is. <laughs> so then it can be kind of a bit gimmicky, you know, you know, I think it, I, th I feel happy with my choice to go and do quite intensive work yes. with musicians playing this music. I don't, I will never know as much as they know, but I, I think it was useful for me to go and, and be in another language doing, you know, really in another musical language, really putting myself through that learning process. But it has made me realize how a lot of these things can be quite superficial, like, okay, it, actually, it's a kind of interesting, what do people even think African music even means, because then you could put a little bit of marimba in and then they're like, okay, cool, African music, you can get the funding. Or you could, you know, little rhythmic tools. And that doesn't necessarily mean you have a good grasp of what that musical tradition could be or so so I know there's some composers who are quite frustrated because their works don't offer their musical language doesn't fit in with that or when they do do like genuine <clears throat> interesting collaborations with with indigenous instrument players or whatever then that ticks the box but when they try to do something else then then they can't get the funding they can't so it can be quite as the people who are often giving the money out or creating the opportunities they themselves know very little about what it means to be an African musician. So so it, it can be quite quizzical and confusing sometimes. Right. And those grants, yeah. right? What you, uh, and what you told, these are some national uh, grants which are provided by South African government or it's foreign international grants? I think very, uh, we have a big like rights organization <clears throat> called SAMRO and they commission work. And, and you can also, I think you can approach them uh, as an as a as a musician, let's say a performer, you could approach them to commission a composer. So it's it's a system like that, but they don't have a lot of money for it. Uh, they've actually been having some financial troubles, so I don't know what's actually going on with that organization. But but so so they have traditionally they were the commission big commissioning body in in South Africa. Um, but now uh, we have uh, Pro Helvetia from Switzerland, probably the most important funders of musical work in, in South Africa. Also Goethe Institute, um, also doing some projects. Um, and then we have in Johannesburg, we have the center, the, the one that I was a part of recently, Center for the Less Good Idea, which is funded by um, William Kentridge, who's a big, very, very big, successful visual artist, uh, older generation now. Um, and I think he he came back to Johannesburg. He, you know, he's exhibited all around the world. I think he made a lot of money and he put his money into like an art center. So he commissioned through that center. There's also a lot of commissions, but that's more, that's much more open-minded. So, so that would be, you would never have to demonstrate Africanness to be a part of that. That's much more about more cutting edge arts making, um, also very interdisciplinary, like many yeah. you know it's it's mostly theater theater and dance people so it's kind of that's a little bit more um 
yeah innovative i would say but uh but yeah it's it, the pro Helvetia, the swiss funding is is the most important we owe the swiss government and the swiss people a lot okay and they <laughs> ask you right this african element right they they don't yeah. but like but i have heard that the without wanting to damage my reputation too much but other of the local opportunities may stipulate that okay got it yeah and how uh new music audience changed during this century mm. i think young it seems to me i mean i can say this because i'm getting a bit older now but it seems to me that young people now in the cities in south africa are interested in different music like different kinds of music so so we've had in um mostly in cape town two or three different like independent ra online radio stations have kind of popped up in the past few years and and just from like look and they're very very popular and then looking at what they program and like the different djs that they get it's really interesting it's really like people are really thinking about music in in much more open ways um and that doesn't that means you know knowing a lot about north african music or i don't know k-pop and or south american experimental music but also that means contemporary new music as well so it seems like people are it's still it's still obviously sidelined but it seems to me that young people are, are in their quest for new sounds and for music being revalued in their lives i think people are are, are now looking around for you know new music that's coming out of south africa uh, and, and, and are less fussy about genres and the siloed ways of making music. So just in that way, I mean, I think it's still kind of an alternative scene, but um, like, like Matthias van Dijk having, who you interviewed before, having a, he had a radio show on one of those uh, stations, just playing kind of new music of South African composers. And um, yeah, I mean, I see a lot of people appreciating that I had with another station, I had a show with a friend of mine, Galina Juritz, who's also a great composer. Um, and in that case, we were playing, it wasn't only South African music, it was a mix of music from all around the world, but electronic music, ambient stuff, minimalist stuff, uh, you know, kind of chamber ensemble music from, from all around and mixing it all. Um, it seems like there is a kind of appetite for that amongst young people. And then, there are, of course, in South Africa, still a lot of older people who want to just hear Beethoven, and that's it. So you kind of classical music anyway is kind of sidelined. And then a big part of that audience is is elderly people who want to hear very traditional repertoire. So, but the younger generation, I think if you can hop over them, the younger generation seem to be interested in a lot more different kinds of music. Mm -hmm. Got it. And um... How do you see, and where this uh, new music uh, scene in South America goes, right? What it will look like in 10 years, right? Let's see your imagination. In South Africa? Yes. That scene? Um, I mean, I hope, I, I have an idea of what I want it to look like. <laughs> then. Um, I, it would be really nice if there were more opportunities for people and their music. I think that would really open things up because there are a lot I mean, of young... They, you mean economical opportunities, right? Yeah, and maybe maybe just in terms of kind of platforms. You know, we've got a couple of venues. Economically, things in the country are not so good, so it's the worst time to think to kind of assess things because a lot of venues have closed down due to COVID, and so it's it's not the normal state of things. But I would hope that what was happening before COVID would continue, which is having smaller ensembles commissioning new works or or smaller venues putting on nights where new new works could be heard. And then that kind of, you know, going up and up to the bigger venues and bigger festivals and that kind of thing where, where South African local composers or even just African composers were being valued. Uh, there is a bit of this because of the decolonial move uh, across the country, but if if there was more of that, I I think that would be good. Unfortunately, that all involves money, and so the economy right now is not in a good situation. So the number one thing would be if that could improve, then hopefully these little grassroots movements or little little opportunities. I think if those continue to be to build, I think it could be a really diverse, interesting scene of new music. Um, but yeah, we'll, that's that's the dream. Hopefully that happens. Mm -hmm.
and uh, and what is uh, what is the role uh, no, what is the role of new music in South uh, Africa society? Um, yeah, as I said before, because of course visual art, like cutting edge, edge visual art is so important. In comparison, I would say new music doesn't have much of a role in South Africa, unfortunately. Um, you know, there are a couple of opportunities where there'll be specific commissions or specific opportunities for someone to compose something who maybe hadn't done that kind of work before, or like little opportunities like that. But, but, and those are kind of, kind of supported, but not as much as much more conventional classical music, musical events or whatever. Um, so I think it unfortunately doesn't have a big role. But if 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 people thought about visual art and new music in the same way, I think it could have a really important role where, where people are reflecting on some kind of vital things that are happening culturally and politically in the country. And that's coming out in a musical form, um, you know, in in whatever abstract or not abstract way. I think that could be really that could be really interesting and, and kind of useful and, you know, a contribution to cultural life and artistic life as well as maybe beyond that. Um, so yeah, right now it's not, it's, you know, it's mostly living in these big academic institutions, but, but if we could break out of that, I think it could, it could be a really important aspect of our kind of artistic life as a country. And last question, uh, what would you suggest, like three suggestions, right, for younger uh, composers and not particularly as well for those uh, who are living and starting a career in South uh, Africa, but not only, right? Yeah. Um, I Three things. Hmm. I would say the first one for me is advice that I got when I was younger, which is just make stuff, make things. Because if your emphasis is on making music and you kind of do it with whatever limited resources you have, whether they are in skills and training or it's uh, access to instruments and, and musicians or, or recording facilities or whatever. If you keep every single time I've made something, even if it didn't come out the way that I thought, I learned something and it led to other opportunities, like hands down every single time. So, so I would say that's the number one thing because everything just builds from that point. If you sit around and don't do things, then nothing for certain nothing happens <laughs> but if you start making things so that's the number one rule for me is make things even if you're early on or you are broke and you don't have any money and you're not sure how to do there is always a way to take whatever limited resources you have and make a thing a creative thing so that would be the first thing the second thing is don't be afraid to have another job <laughs> i think that's really important <laughs> for composers um, many very brilliant composers have had other jobs and other careers, and realistically, that is and many artists of all kinds have done it. Um, I think it's kind of humbling, and I think no one is too good, you know, to not have another job. I think also that you value the time you get to spend on your art more when you have something else you have to do, and sometimes it's also productive. Like you actually need a break from sitting trying to resolve a musical thing by doing something very boring and administrative or teaching kids or whatever it is. So I think that, and third, hmm, burnout is a problem for creative people. Um, so try to rest as much as possible. That would be the third. <laughs> Thank you very much um, for our conversation. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me.